حضورنا كريم هناك عبارة شائعة ألا وهي أن الوقت يمر بسرعة وإن كان هذا صحيحا فهذا يعني أن المستقبل قادم بسرعة أيضا والواقع هو أيضا أن كل لحظة قادمة هي المستقبل قد يصح القول حينها بأننا نعيش المستقبل في الوقت الراهن حضورنا كريم في وقت من الأوقات كانت ترند أو كانت الصيحة هي محركات البحث التي تجيب على أكثر أسئلتنا المستعصية وقد تكون أسئلة نعرف أن إجاباتها متوفرة لكننا نريد توفير الوقت نستعين بتلك المحركات كي نحصل على تلك الإجابات في أسرع وقت ولكن الآن محركات البحث هذه أصبحت الآن تحت مرمى تهديد لمنافس آخر ليس سوى نظام ذكاء اصطناعي صغير حديث النشأة ليس بعمرها بالطبع لكنه يتعلم يوما بعد يوم كجي بي تي تشات إن سمع أحدكم به أمر آخر هو هناك شركات ناشئة أو كيك ستارتر كما تسمى تعلن عن اختراع سوف يخرج في نهاية هذا العام في الربع الرابع بالتحديد وهي قفازات تحتوي على أكتويترز أو واقعيات تقوم بتحويل أي ملمس في الواقع الافتراضي إلى واقعنا الملموس إذا المستقبل مخيف لكن مخيف من ناحية جميلة وإيجابية حضورنا كريم لهذا نأتي إلى جلستنا الختامية تحت عنوان المستقبل أسرع مما تظن وختامها مسك بإذن الله تعالى هل رحبنا سويا وبحرارة بالمؤسس والرئيس التنفيذي لمؤسسة إكس برايز والذي سيطلعكم أكثر على أفكار واختراعات أخرى ما ناقشته الآن لم يكن سوى أوراق أشجار من غابات سيناقشها رحبوا سوية بمتحدثنا الرئيسي الدكتور بيتر دايامانديس Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to speak to you about the meta trends, the tremendous transformation that's about to occur this decade that's going to impact every aspect of our lives. Now, it's hard to remember with all the negative news we see every day how incredible the world has become. Over the last hundred plus years, we have seen extreme poverty. drop from 90% down to 10% on this planet. We have seen the number of people who cannot read drop from 80% to 15%. We have seen the number of children dying under the age of five from 45%, a coin flip, down to 5%. And at the same time, we've seen global life expectancy go from 30 or 40% to 80 and upward. We're seeing access to electricity explode onto the planet, and electricity means food and water and medicine and reading and learning. And then we've seen global access to the internet blossom throughout this world. So the question is, why is this happening? Why are all these trends transforming the way we live? Is it that we're getting smarter? Or perhaps is it the impact of technology, the result of converging exponentials? And so what I want to share with you today is this incredible revolution that's occurring in technologies that's transforming every aspect of our lives. This is a very famous plot. This is the amount of computational power per dollar. It's known as Moore's Law. It's plotted on a log scale. What we see is for the last 50 years, the amount of computation you could buy for a dollar has doubled every 18 to 24 months consistently over time. And that increase in computation has driven an entire population of exponential technologies. Computation, sensors, networks, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, augmented, virtual reality, blockchain, As computation has doubled, so have these technologies. And it used to be that you could be an expert as a CEO, as a leader in any one of these. But today, you need to be an expert in three, four, or five of these coming together, converging and transforming entire industries. 
it's creating abundance on this planet. So when I speak about exponentials, what does that mean? We're all linear thinkers, 100 billion neurons in our brains, 100 trillion synaptic connections. We are linear thinkers. If I take 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five, and 30 steps, I'm 30 meters away. But if I take 30 exponential steps, where an exponential is a simple doubling, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, in 30 doublings, I'm not 30 meters away. In 30 doublings, I'm a billion meters away. To say it differently, in 30 doublings, I've gone around the planet 26 times. The difference between the way we think linearly and the way the world is changing exponentially is dramatic. If you plot it, it looks like this. This red line is all of us. It's our friends, it's our families, it's our teachers, it's our customers. We as humans have not had a hardware or software upgrade in two million years. It's been a while. But the technology that we're investing in, that we're building, that we're creating, that technology is doubling every 12 to 18 to 24 months. And the difference between these two is either disruptive stress, if you're a company being put out of business, or it's disruptive opportunity, if you're an entrepreneur creating a new industry. So I want to speak about the meta trends, the forces that these technologies are driving. You see, technology is a force that takes whatever used to be scarce and makes it abundant over and over again. What would you think of as more scarce than a perfect diamond? A uh, five, six, seven, eight carat, perfect, flawless diamond. Well, it used to be scarce. But what we're seeing today are companies like Pandora, which has stopped selling diamonds that are mined and is only creating and selling lab-grown diamonds. These are perfect diamonds five, 10, 20 carat diamonds. I'd like to show you what a real diamond ring looks like. So imagine a world in what, what used to be scarce can be made abundant through the use of this technology. Another example in the carbon world is we've just launched a $100 million X prize that uh, Elon funded for removing gigatons of carbon out of the atmosphere. Of course, we're heading towards a world of increasing energy abundance. We go back 150 years. We used to go and kill whales on the ocean to get whale oil to light the night so we could read. Then we ravaged mountainsides for coal. Then we drilled kilometers under the ground for natural gas and oil. And it's important to remember that we live on a planet that is bathed in 8,000 times more energy from the sun than we consume as a species in a year. Energy is not scarce, it's just not in a usable form. And that's what technology is doing. Of course, the vast investments that have come from the UAE in this area are epic. We're seeing in the United States this year half of the new energy production coming from solar. We're seeing wind at all new highs. We're seeing battery technology being built at ever increasing rates globally, these gigafactories. What's driving this, this electrification of our economy, is that country after country is specifying you can only sell electric cars in our nation after 2030 or 2035 or 2040. So we see General Motors and Toyota and Ford and Volkswagen committing hundreds of billions of dollars to electrifying their entire fleets. And while that's changing the world, what may really change the world is some of the recent announcements we're seeing in fusion, right? Today, there are 35 privately funded fusion companies with the objective of commercial grade fusion by the end of this decade. Let's talk about an abundance of food because we're reinventing how and where we produce our food. One third of the planet's land area is used for livestock. As more people become more affluent, more abundant, they're gonna demand that they have access to fish and chicken and beef. Well, perhaps the way we'll produce that in the future is what's called lab-grown protein, right? From a stem cell, from a chicken or a fish or a cow, growing an entire steak. Uh, this 
is an example at $3.90 a pound today. We announced three years ago here in the Emirates a $15 million prize called Feeding the Next Billion to produce a new generation of stem cell grown fish and chicken. Of course, we're seeing vertical farming, where instead of just farming during the daylight hours when the season is correct, being able to farm 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Some of the largest indoor farms at Walmart here in Netherlands, and of course, here in Dubai at EcoOne. Let's look at the impact of artificial intelligence. We heard a little bit in the last session. There is no greater force that's going to change the face of the planet this decade than artificial intelligence. Perhaps biology as well, but AI for sure. This is a quote from the CEO of uh, Alphabet who says, artificial intelligence could have more profound implications for humanity than electricity or fire. I agree with him. Elon Musk says it differently. He says, companies have to race to build AI or they will be made uncompetitive. Essentially, if your competitor is racing to build AI, they will crush you. Uh, a friend of mine, Imad Mustak, who's the CEO of Stability.ai, one of the new generative AI models, said, Google and Microsoft are going all in with generative AI as core to their future. There is no, we're still early. This is a these are trillion dollar companies shifting their entire strategies, and it's true. The way I describe it is the following. In the next decade, there are going to be two kinds of companies on the planet. Those that are fully utilizing artificial intelligence and those that are out of business. It's going to be that black and white. It's like not using the phone or not using a computer. The incredible news over the last six months has been all about OpenAI's GPT-3 and ChatGPT, a 175 billion parameter large language model that has has analyzed the entire internet and understands statistically what words follow what words and what images look like. These generative pre-trained transformer models have shocked people of what's possible. Let me share some examples. One of them is called Dolly, where you can put a text, a prompt, and ask it to make an image. And here, the prompt is create an image of a living room with two white armchairs and a painting of the Colosseum mounted over a modern fireplace. And it will generate hundreds of variations of exactly what you said. We're seeing initially a billion dollar investment in OpenAI by Microsoft, now a $10 billion investment. And one of the most extraordinary things that ChatGPT is able to do is called basically uh, a no-code application where you can speak to it, tell it what you want it to program, and it will program it for you. So if you're a lawyer but can't program, you can program using this technology. If you're a physician and can't program, you can program with this technology. Google is building a 540 billion parameter version. And of course, OpenAI is not stopping there. They've announced what they call their GPT-4, which is 500 times larger than GPT-3. What has changed the world in the last six months is called ChatGPT. It's an alternative to a search engine. And what we're seeing is the fastest adoption of a new technology that the human race has ever seen. So let me share what that means. So this is the length of time it took for an, an application or a company to achieve a million users. Netflix took 43 months to go from startup to reaching a million users. Twitter took two years. Facebook took 10 months. Instagram took two and a half months. And ChatGPT took five days. Let me give you some examples of what ChatGPT can do because it is able to simulate how a human thinks in a wide range of areas. And one of the concepts is that every profession, everyone here will have a AI co-pilot, someone who works with you in whatever you do. 
You're an architect, you're a designer, you're a physician, you're a lawyer. So this first one was a tweet from two weeks ago on January, or actually less than that, three days ago, January 22nd, that ChatGPT has passed the medical licensing exam, the US MLEs. Normally it takes four years of medical school and two years of clinical rotations. It passed it like that. We heard in the last session as well that ChatGPT passed the Wharton University MBA exam. So what does that mean? I'm gonna show you a couple of examples here. Here's the first one by a physician who's gonna show you how he is using ChatGPT. ChatGPT might just take my job as a doctor. Get the louder. I was just having fun. I gave it a patient, told it it had chest pain, asked for life threats to eliminate, and it gave me every single cause and explained it to me. The scariest part is I gave it a patient history with nuances that it needed to integrate, like colon cancer research resection. And it diagnosed the patient for me. What? This, this is my job. This is what we do. So we're seeing a physician basically put the patient data in and chat GPT diagnosing that patient accurately for the physician. Here's another example. And chat GPT is a text interface. You're typing into it. It's free. You should all go home and try it. And what this person is writing in this, in the, in the prompt box is draft a commercial lease for a South Carolina-based property with a two-year term and eight one-year extensions. It's asking it to write a lease document. And then it generates the lease document for you. Right? It has looked at every lease on the internet and understands the laws in South Carolina, understands the parameters, and generates a first draft. Now, it may not be the final work, but it saves you incredible time. How fast is this progressing and what does it mean for all of us? You know, it went from something that was interesting to, oh my God, this might change my life or my family's life, my kid's life. Ray Kurzweil, who is my mentor, my business partner at Singularity University, uh, considered one of the greatest thinkers in the field of AI, projected that, and he's held this for last 15 years, that by 2029 is the date at which artificial intelligence will reach human level. And in 2030, it surpassed human level. What does that mean? Well, not to be outdone, Elon Musk's assessment is that AI will be vastly smarter than humans and will overtake us by 2025. This is not something to think about 30 years from now or 20 or 10. It's the next five to 10 years. Another meta trend is how fast we're connecting the planet. Today, we have 3,000 space Starlink satellites overhead, heading towards 30,000 at 100 megabit connection speeds. We're about 5 billion people connected on the internet today. In the next five years, we're about to add 3 billion new consumers, 3 billion people who've never been connected before. What are they gonna want? What are they gonna buy? What ideas are they gonna create? Besides that, Greg Weiler, another friend, is building 100,000 satellite constellation to connect not only everyone, but everything, a trillion sensors on the planet connected. We're seeing 5G exploding onto the scene, right, with 2.8 billion connections by 2025. And then there's 6G that's coming. It's 100 times faster than 5G. All right, we've got energy, we've got AI, we've got communications. What else is coming? Robotics are coming. Humanoid robots are coming. Uh, we're going to see robots doing surgery. So the best surgeons in the world will be digitized and your robot will provide it, provide it at marginal cost. This is a robotic avatar. There's a person in a VR helmet and a haptic suit, and the robot is basically doing whatever the person needs so you can put your senses and your actions at a distance, 100 kilometers away, 500 kilometers away. This is a robot called Amica out of, out of the UK. Um, Amica, with engineering arts, is powered by GPT-3 for communications, but what you see is very human-like emotions and expressions. These are the early versions of what we're going to see coming this very decade. 
And of course, Optimus Production Optimus. Unit 1, uh, which is the ability to move uh, all the fingers independently, uh, move the, uh, to have the, the thumb have uh, two degrees of freedom, uh, so it has opposable thumbs, and uh, both left and right hand, so it's able to operate uh, tools and do useful things. Our goal is to make um, a, a useful humanoid robot as quickly as possible. Optimus is designed to be an extremely capable robot, but made in, in very high volume, probably ultimately millions of units, um, and I, it, it is expected to cost much less than a car. I would say probably less than $20,000 would be my guess. This means uh, a future of abundance, a future where um, there, there is no poverty, where people, you can have whatever you want in terms of products and services. Um, it really is a, a, a fundamental transformation of civilization as we know it. A future of abundance where there is no poverty. That is really what we're heading towards in terms of uplifting humanity on this planet. And that is the goal and what can happen. Of course, we're seeing another toy ro robot coming on, which is autonomous transportation. Um, GM crews on the streets of San Francisco and this year here on the streets of Dubai. Uh, we're seeing uh, Pony.ai in Shenzhen. Uh, we're seeing Waymo traveling in California and Arizona. And of course, Elon truly promises autonomous cars by the end of this year. So, a new generation of transportation. But of course, it's not just autonomous and autonomous electric cars. It's also flying cars. We're seeing a new generation of eVTOLs, electric vertical takeoff or landing. This is one of the earliest companies out there, Joby, that went public for $6.6 billion a couple years ago. This is Lilium out of, the U out of Germany, which also went public. Uh, a friend's company out of New Hampshire called Beta has a large contract with a medical company called United Therapeutics to deliver lungs that are being manufactured to hospitals for transplantation. And of course, the UAE in Dubai in particular has one of the leaders in adopting this technology now for the last three or four years. Probably for me, the most exciting technology out there in terms of well-being is biotech and health technologies. There is no greater wealth than your health. At the end of the day, if you can give an extra 10, 20, 30 years of healthy living to an individual, there's nothing of greater value for a nation or for a family. We're seeing an extraordinary revolution. Uh, I remember 20 years ago in, in around 2000, uh, Craig Venter sequenced his own genome. It took $100 million and nine months. That's how long it took to sequence a genome in the year 2000, $100 million and nine months. Today, it's down to seven hours and $100. It's moving five times faster than Moore's Law. At the same time that we can read these genomes, we're also able to edit the genome. In 2020, two amazing women won the Nobel Prize for CRISPR. What CRISPR allows us to do is not to treat any genetic disease, but to cure it. We're talking about extraordinary levels of cure for blindness, for a multitude of thalassemias and sickle cell anemias. One of the companies I'm an advisor for is using CRISPR to bring back extinct animals. This is a company called Colossal that's announced it is bringing back the woolly mammoth, the Tasmanian tiger, the dodo. It's just raised $150 million at a $1.3 billion valuation to use these technologies to de-extinguish these species. We've seen vaccines become an extraordinary tool for humanity. Moderna is working now on an HIV vaccine. One of my company's vaccinity has a vaccine against Alzheimer's, against Parkinson's, against heart disease and stroke. We're talking about being able to protect the human race against the diseases that, of old age that kill us today. This is another technology. Imagine in the future where you have an extra set of lungs, liver, kidneys, or heart, if you should ever need one. 
This is United Therapeutics that's re-engineering organs to create an abundant supply of organs. This is a friend, Dean Kamen, one of the most prolific inventors on the planet, who has built a machine funded by the US government. In one end goes induced pluripotent stem cells. Those cells are expanded, grown, differentiated. Out the other end comes an organ. What they're working on right now is pediatric hearts, a heart for a newborn who needs a new one. Probably the most exciting work going on right now is the idea of epigenetic reprogramming, the idea that you can not only slow aging and stop aging, but reverse aging. This is work that's done out of Harvard and out of Salk. We're seeing the work now done in human cells in vitro, but we're going from mice and rats to dogs and eventually to humans. It is quite possible. Actually, this, if I can turn the volume up on this one second, please. This is, every year I bring a group of my abundance members on a longevity platinum trip. We visit the top scientists and the top researchers in the field of longevity. I want to show you a very short clip from two of the greatest longevity experts on the planet, Dr. George Church at Harvard Medical School and Dr. David Sinclair at Harvard College. And listen to what they have to say about how long you might live. It is quite possible that some of the people in, uh, alive today will, will see no upper limit. Imagine having a treatment, perhaps a viral uh, delivery of these three genes when you're 45, everything's good, you reach 50, biologically you can measure that, uh, and then you get a course of doxycycline, three weeks later, uh, many, if not all, parts of your body are rejuvenated. Uh, and then you reset the clock. And then you reset the clock. So what do you think for your own life if you had an extra 20 or 30 healthy years? Right? What would you do with it? How would it impact you? How would it impact your family? This was a study done out of London School of Business, Harvard, and Oxford that said if we can add just one healthy year onto the population of the planet, it would be worth $38 trillion to the global economy in terms of increased productivity and reduced health care costs. One of the things that I'm very proud to do is I run an organization called the XPRIZE Foundation. We put up large-scale global competitions uh, to drive breakthroughs. Our first was a $10 million prize for private space flight. That was won uh, by Bert Rutan and Paul Allen, and then Richard Branson bought the rights to create Virgin Galactic. We've run X prizes to map the ocean floor and to pull water out of the atmosphere. Uh, X prizes to have a Star Trek-like tricorder. Uh, we're running an X prize today out of the UAE to feed the next billion people. One of the prizes I've been working on for some time, and we hope to announce this coming year, is an age reversal X prize. We're calling it a health span X prize. We're going to be asking teams to reverse the functional age of your muscle, your skin, your immune, and your cognition. So you look good, you feel great, you can move around, and you can think clearly and make you 20 years younger than you were. It's a $101 million competition, which will run for about a seven-year period. The idea of reversing biological age was a crazy idea. But you have to remember, as humans, we evolved to live till age 30. We would have children 100,000 years ago at age 12. By the time we were 24, 25, 26, our children were having children and we were grandparents. And before we had abundant food, the worst thing we could do was steal food from our grandchildren's mouths, so we would pass on. There was no force that was beneficial for us living past the age of 30. And we didn't. But in the future, we're going from evolution by natural selection, Darwinism, perhaps to evolution by scientific design. So I'll close with these thoughts. I believe we're truly living during the most extraordinary time ever in human history. There's never been a more exciting time to live than today, perhaps tomorrow. And the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. 
I leave this with you. If you'd like a copy of these slides, please share them with your friends, your family, your children. For me, one of the most important things is that as we're barraged by all the negative news in the world, I encourage you to realize that we're living in a time where we truly can uplift every man, woman, and child. That there is no problem we cannot solve. I'm grateful to the leadership of the Emirates in Dubai for the work that you're doing in promoting all of these fields. It's an extraordinary place on this planet. Thank you, an honor again to be here. Thank you very much.